Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 246 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about dowsing. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. The practice of dowsing goes by many names, and it's been used for hundreds of years, at least. Dowsers use a variety of techniques to find water, gold, oil, and other things. Today, we begin looking at the practice of dowsing, and we speak with an expert on the topic. What is dowsing? What do we know about it? And how does it work? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we need to say to begin today's mystery? Today will be the first part of a two-part discussion of dowsing. This week, we'll be giving you the background on the practice itself. And next week, we'll go into analysis mode and look at it from the faith and reason perspectives. I'm pleased to say that we will be discussing the subject with an expert dowser. His name is Dr. Paul Smith, and he's been on the program before. We interviewed him in episode 156 and again in episode 157, where he talked uh, with us about his experiences in the Defense Department's Stargate program, where he served as one of the government's original psychic spies using a discipline known as remote viewing. We won't really be talking with him today about remote viewing, though, because Paul is also an expert in the practice of dowsing, and that's our topic this time. What should we know about dowsing before we get to the interview? It goes by a bunch of names. The oldest term for it in English seems to be divining, a, um, as when people speak of a, of a divining rod. This term seems to have come into use in the late 1300s, and it's based on the Latin word divinare, which originally meant to be inspired by a god. It's also called rhabdomancy, a term from the 1640s, and that word is based on the Greek roots rhabdos, meaning rod, and manteia, meaning oracle. So rhabdomancy is obtaining an oracle from a rod. The word dowsing itself originated in England in the 1690s, and we're not really sure where it comes from, which is kind of cool to have a mystery word like that. The practice is also sometimes called water witching, a term that was popular in the 19th century, but seems to be falling out of usage and is less common today. Perhaps the most recent term for dowsing was coined in 1929 by the French priest Father Alexis Boulet, who gave it the name radiesthesia, from the Latin word radius, meaning a ray, like a ray of light, and the Greek word asthesis, which means feeling. So the idea would be that the dowser is feeling rays of some kind that are being emitted by the water or whatever else he's searching for. Except for dowsing, though, all of these are theory-laden terms, meaning that they suggest a particular theory about how dowsing works. Uh, divining suggests that the action of a god is involved. It's also a really broad term, and there are other kinds of divination, so that's kind of too broad. Um, rhabdomancy suggests that you're getting an oracle because of the mantea part of the word. Water witching suggests that witchcraft of some kind is involved, and radiesthesia suggests that rays of some kind are involved. Uh, these terms also can have negative prejudicial overtones, and between that and the fact that they're theory-laden and presuppose a particular idea about how dowsing works, we're going to be using the neutral term dowsing, uh, which, because of its obscure word origin, is not theory-laden and is neutral about what might explain dowsing. Is there anything we should cover before we start? Yeah, one of the things that... Um, I'd like to do is demonstrate that something that comes up in my discussion with Paul, because it's one of the most common explanations for dowsing among skeptics. It's a phenomenon known as the idiomotor effect. Idio comes from the Latin word idea, which means idea. 
And motor is Latin for I am moved. So the concept of the idiomotor effect is moving something by having the idea of it moving. Now, that might sound like psychokinesis or mind over matter, but it's not. The idiomotor effect is purely natural. It's not a paranormal phenomenon. Back in the 19th century, when the spiritualist movement got started, mediums were engaging in practices like table turning and table tipping, um, in which people at a seance would lay their hands on a table and the table would start moving without them consciously trying to move it. Uh, people also would use a device known as a planchette, which means little plank in French, to hold a pen. They'd put their hands on the planchette, and without consciously moving it, the planchette would start moving and writing out messages from the spirits. This is the same principle that's used in modern Ouija boards that use pointing devices that are also called planchettes to point to different letters. And people who use Ouija boards report not consciously directing the pointer to specific letters. Instead, the pointer seems to move on its own. Well, in the 19th century, parapsychologists started wondering about whether the people doing the table tipping and using planchettes might be unconsciously moving them. Maybe the spirits weren't responsible for the movements at all. Maybe the people's hands were exerting slight pressure without them realizing it, and that's what was responsible for the movements, including meaningful ones like messages. So they did controlled experiments. Uh, they discovered that it was indeed the muscles of living people producing the movements without being aware of it, not spirits exerting psychokinetic force on the objects. And that's what the ideomotor effect is. It's the idea of having an object moving and then you and or others subconsciously use your muscles in a way that causes the object that you're touching to move, even though you're not consciously trying to make it. And this is one of the proposed skeptical explanations for dowsing. The skeptics will say that a dowsing rod or pendulum will move simply because of the idiomotor effect. Uh, one of the scientists who investigated this in the 1800s was Michael Faraday, who was the guy that basically figured out electromagnetism. And we'll have a link to a video where you can watch how he did his experiments on this subject. So the ideomotor effect is a real thing that actually exists. Yes, and I've known that we'd be talking about it in various episodes of Mysterious World for some time. So a while back, I got a pendulum and started practicing the ideomotor effect with it. And I can just think what I want the pendulum to do, and I can make it start swinging left to right, or forward and back, or clockwise, or counterclockwise, or make it stop without consciously moving my hand to produce these motions. It's subconscious. And I'd like to demonstrate that for us now. The viewers of the video version of the podcast will see this on screen. But for our audio listeners, I'll need you, Dom, to confirm uh, when the pendulum does what I'm telling it to do. So here we go. First, I'm going to have it move left and right. So left and right, left and right, left and right. And as I say that, it gets a bigger and bigger effect, even though I'm not consciously moving my hand. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, let's transition now from left to right to forward and back. Forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. And the effect continues to get bigger, even though I'm not consciously moving my hand. Is it going forward and back? Oh, yes. Now let's do clockwise. So spinning in the direction of a clock. It's now moving both forward and back and left and right in a way such that it spins clockwise. Is that correct? That's correct. And let's reverse it counterclockwise, counterclockwise, counterclockwise. And in just a moment, since we're reversing that direction, it starts spinning the other direction. It starts going counterclockwise, and the effect gets bigger the longer I leave it do that. Right? Yep, that's right. Okay, finally, stop. I just want it to stop. And in a couple of moments, it uh, stops moving as much and it eventually settles down into a very small amount of movement that's just caused by random, you know, the random muscle movements we have in our hands all the time. So that's an example of how without me consciously 
moving my hand to produce those effects at all. I can just think about it, and my subconscious will tell the muscles in my arm and in my hand to move in imperceptible ways that will make the pendulum do what I want. And so the idea from skeptics is that that's, that's what's happening in dowsing. Um, that, you know, a dowser subconsciously at a certain point wants the dowsing rod to move or the pendulum to move in a certain way. And so the idiomotor effect causes that to happen, which actually means that I could have a harder time dowsing than other people. Uh, because of all the idiomotor practice I've had, I could just think of what I want the dowsing rod or the pendulum, especially pendulum, since I practice with those. I could just think of what I want it to do, and it'll do it. So my conscious mind and the idiomotor practice I've had could serve as a distraction if I were trying to douse. And now, having demonstrated the concept, uh, which will be important in our discussion, let's go to my interview with Dr. Paul Smith. And right before we do that, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Anita H., George C., Catherine K., Ramona F., and Chris and Angela E. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. And by delivercontacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices, with free delivery, visit delivercontacts.com. And now let's get to that interview with Dr. Paul Smith. Dr. Paul H. Smith is a retired Army intelligence officer and Desert Storm veteran. During his military career, he earned the rank of major. He spent seven years in the Department of Defense's remote viewing program, which ultimately became known as Stargate. He thus served as one of the military's original psychic spies. He was trained in remote viewing by Ingo Swan and then served as an operational remote viewer, theory instructor and trainer, security officer, and unit historian. He has a BA in Middle Eastern Studies from Brigham Young University and an MS in Strategic Intelligence with a Middle East emphasis from the Defense Intelligence University. After leaving the military, he earned a PhD in philosophy from the University of Texas at Austin, he is the president of Remote Viewing Instructional Services, Inc., and he is a founding director and past president of the nonprofit International Remote Viewing Association. Paul is the author of several books, and in addition to being a remote viewer, he's also a dowser, which is what we'll be discussing today. Dr. Paul Smith, welcome back to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Thank you. It's always nice to trans be transferred across the universe to your uh, mysterious world. <laughs> Um, now, before we get into the history of dowsing, let's set the stage by talking about some of your personal experiences with it. Tell me about dowsing for teddy bears. Yeah, that's one of my more memorable moments, I think. Uh, if, if it wasn't such a long story, I'd probably have it engraved on my headstone. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Back in 2014, we, we moved from Austin, Texas, where we lived for about 17 years, to southern Utah, the mount, up in the mountains a bit. And uh, on the way, we stopped at some friends' houses in eastern, uh, friends', friends house in eastern Arizona. And it is, is a nice place. You know, it's out in kind of their mountains, and, and, and in the White Mountains, actually, literally. And so we're there, and we, we visited them a lot, a long time, numerous times in the past. But this time... Uh, we are visiting, and uh, this is an uh, uh, elderly couple. They've unfortunately since passed on, but uh, at that time they were pushing 80 or maybe into 80, which I'm kind of breathing down the neck of, so maybe I better not call them elderly. <laughs> but anyway. Um, 88 more, is the new 40. It, yeah, for most of us. <laughs> so so uh, the wife's name is Flois, um, and she was... <laughs> 
she was the matriarch of the family and definitely had a mind of her own. No, nobody pushed voice around. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a, a feeling for her character. But uh, she and my wife, Darl, were sitting in their living room and, and voice starts complaining about something that had happened uh, about a year and a half before. And she had been to the big city, is in this little town of Eager, Arizona, the shopping is Phoenix, essentially, or Flagstaff. Um, and she had found a really great deal on teddy bears. Uh, and she had bought one for each of her 14 grandchildren. She brought them home and had put them somewhere and for 18 months couldn't find them. And everyone in the family had tried to help her find them and nobody has succeeded. So as she's going on and on to Darl about these darn missing teddy bears, uh, apparently they were in a big cardboard box and uh, somewhere in the house, um, probably in the basement. She thought they were in a storage room and um, that was downstairs. And I thought, well, maybe I can pay back their hospitality by finding her teddy bears using dowsing. So I go downstairs and <laughs> was suddenly confronted with a serious problem. Uh, there were actually three different places they could be. Uh, the garage, which was pretty big. It was about a four-car garage, and there was a lot of crap in there. Uh, there was another storage room, and then there was this really uh, much larger storage room, which is where she thought they were. So I employed my dowsing skills, and I, I was using those. I discounted the garage and this other smaller storage room as a likely location, and in fact, indicated on the uh, the big storage room. Okay, well, that didn't help me much because I opened the door and go in there and there were, let me see, I, I have to remember back. I'll have to look the pictures actually to get an accurate picture, but there were a series of shelves in there. There were shelves all the way around, floor to ceiling, the outside of the room, which I'm going to guess was about maybe 20 by 30 feet or maybe more, something like that. There was actually another little closet behind there that was also full of storage. And um, the shelves in the middle of the room, there was at least two full ones that went the length of the room. Um, and maybe there's a third one. Anyway, there were they were deep shelves, and there were cardboard boxes on both sides of those, floor to ceiling, around the edges, floor to ceiling, and they all were identical. Um, so here I am. Okay, so somewhere in here, there's some teddy bears. I don't know. Um, and um, I was using what I call deviceless dowsing. I, other people call it that too, where I just essentially kind of put my hands in front of me like this and use that as a pointer. And how the so indicators... For, for, for listeners of the audio version yeah. of the podcast, you kind of put your hands yeah. together in the praying yeah. position. Yeah. And use that as a pointer, but you're not using a physical device like a dowsing rod. Exactly. And uh, I see I zoomed my camera in so far, so you can't see me doing that very well. But you're you're an excellent stand-in there, Jimmy. I appreciate that. So I use that process, and, uh, and my indicator in that is like I get a kind of a thrill or a tingly feeling when I'm in the, pointing in the right direction. And so I used that, and I went up and down the aisles between the shelves and around the outside of the room, and, and I was getting kind of pulling me in a certain, I felt like I was being moved in a certain direction. So I go down the, the one aisle that I was in, uh, indicated for, and, and so I said I normally get a thrill or whatever. It didn't happen this time. It just felt like I was moving downhill, even though there's no elevation change in here. It's like I was moving downhill, and when I started to go uphill, it's like I didn't didn't feel motivated to go uphill, and I'm just kind of like a, a, a ball sinking into a you know a wrinkle on a bed or something. You know, and here I am. I'm going, well, this isn't helping much. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm facing these shelves, and there's a box in front of me, and I say, well, it won't hurt to see what's in the box. And I pulled it off the shelf, and I opened up the top. And it was stuffed full of teddy bears. Yay. Yay. And on the back of the box, it said teddy bears, but that had been shoved in against the other row. And so there's no way of seeing it, right? So I said, well, this is pretty cool. <laughs> and so I take the box, and we're talking a pretty good-sized box. As you can imagine, before teddy bears were about these dimensions, you know, it was, it was big. 
And I go walking up the stairs and voice is still griping about those teddy bears. Oh, I really wish I could find my gift to all my grandkids for Christmas this year. Uh, and I and I walk in and she kind of looks up and sees me with a box. And he kind of, what, what? You know, you could see her 80-year-old brain was kind of crunched what was happening. I walk up and I dump all those bears out at her feet. <laughs> and she goes... How did you find those? <laughs> and, and I became instantly her favorite non DNA child, you know. So, okay, uh, she was very thrilled. I have pictures of, of us and her husband with those bears, they're all piled all around her. And, uh, maybe, maybe you'll get a chance to pop one in here somewhere. I don't know. Oh, ab- absolutely, yeah. we'll have pictures in the video version. Yeah, that would be great. So, uh, so anyway. That so in, in in homing in on those, you you approached them and then you felt like you weren't being led further. You described it as kind of like being a ball rolling into a depression. It also would seem to be kind of like a hotter, colder experience. You're not really getting. Yeah, it's you, kind of a colder, new, you know, and colder. Well, this is where it's warmest. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Mean, obviously, that wasn't the sensation I was experiencing, but. But that's a good uh, metaphor for her analogy. Okay. So um, now dowsing for teddy bears, that's something you've done fairly recently. But let's go back to your time in Stargate. How did you first become interested in dowsing and why? Because you were trained as a remote viewer. So why did you become interested in this other discipline? So the first thing people want when they find out you're psychic or they declare that you're psychic is they want you to either you know, predict the future, particularly lottery numbers, or they want you to find something or someone that's missing. And those are literally the two hardest things for any psychic to do. We associate them with being psychic for two reasons. One is that um, these these requests usually come up when all other methods, all of the conventional methods have failed. So it's kind of a last ditch. How are we going to solve this? Let's call in a psychic or a remote viewer. Okay. And the other reason is um, that we've come to associate these kinds of tasks with psychics uh, and remote viewers um, and think that that's something that we're good at. But that's only because the successes, the relatively rare successes, are broadcast far and wide. And the failures are kind of ignored and pushed off to the side. The many more frequent failures are pushed off to the side. The fact is that these two, that that um, finding missing things is really hard to do, uh, even if you're psychic. It just happens that you can actually succeed sometimes when nothing else works. Okay? And there's documented cases, anecdotal essentially, of this happening uh, in terms of psychics finding missing people and such. Um, so here we are for me, and uh, we're con- confronted with what we came to call the search problem. And the search problem is this. Remote viewing is a descriptive methodology. It essentially relies on, to, to speak very loosely, it relies on the right brain uh, pattern recognition, uh, descriptive sensory, uh, sensory uh, processing holistic kind of perceptual process, right? Uh, that was a kind of a weird way of saying it, but mm-hmm. still, you get the idea. Basically, Whereas, you're, you're pulling in sensory impressions of some yeah. target. So they tell you, we want you yeah. to view Osama bin Laden, and you say, or they you're tell good. you, we want you to view this target number, and yeah. you say, oh, it's a guy, he's got a beard, he's in a yeah. cave, there are carpets. And his name is like Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you've heard my story before. Yeah, so so yeah, that's the problem. You can describe the setting of an intended target, but what people really want to locate them is either an address or, or a latitude and longitude. Right? But those are left brain functions, and so you don't get those in remote viewing well at all, and in general, in psychic behavior in general, at all, or, or very rarely. And so... As I like to say in remote viewing, a remote viewer can find someone or something's missing. They just can't locate them. Right? So, um, in, 
and that that raises a major problem. We call it the search problem. How do you find something you can't that you don't know how to find? <laughs> Essentially, how do you locate something that you can find but don't know how to locate? Um, so dowsing seems to be a kind of a, uh, a appropriate alternative. Uh, it has been practiced for a long time. We're going to talk about that. Um, and it allows you, so so in remote viewing and dowsing, I, I, I talk about them as being like the inverse of each other, right? So in remote viewing, speaking very roughly, you know where something is, but you don't know what it is. Because usually a remote viewing target, you get a, a, a lat, latitude or longitude or a tasking number or whatever, and then the viewer projects his or her consciousness to that location and describes what's there, which is unknown. In the military, we usually, did, you know, there might be a denied facility in which there was something secret that the Russians were doing. We didn't know what it was. Um, and so the viewer get targeted on that location and requested to perceive or explore the interior, describe what was going on there. So we knew where, where what it was, we knew where it was, we didn't know what it was. The dowsing is kind of the other way around. You know what it is you're looking for, you don't know where it is. Um, for example, water. You want you want to douse for water, you know what it is you're looking for, it's water. But where is it? Where are we going to find the location where we can access water? So you've got that other site. If you put the two together, you can use remote viewing to identify what it is and dowsing then to locate where it is. That, that's the, the theory anyway. So um, even from the early days of the program, remote being program, they toyed around with dowsing. Um, and I guess I'll go into the history of that right now. One yeah. of their fun little projects was they had this old push mower, right? And on the back lot of Fort Meade, there's all these old ammo bunkers. There's, I don't know, I want to say there's 12 of them there. Could be more. At least there used to be. They may have bulldozed them by now. But they were there. There was no locks on the door except for one, which is where they kept the ammo for the for the MPs and the, and the, the guards on Fort Meade. Uh, the rest of them, door was doors were unlocked. You could go in. You know, you want to go in. So Skip Howard took like this whole beat up push lawnmower, and uh, Skip was the training and operations officer uh, at Fort Meade. And he and he'd go over there to to these ammo bunkers, and he just randomly select the bunker. I, I'm not sure if he used a random number generator or flipped a coin or what, but he would put the it in a bunker, and then he'd, you know, he'd go back to the office, and then he would assign the remote viewers for practice and to try and explore the skills to douse where that push mower was. And uh, I don't know. I've seen um, I've seen. So they actually, the first couple of times, as I recall, there's a transcript of them remote viewing what it was first. Right? So they're kind of following the process. And then they douse where it was. And then there were cases where they, they were told what it was, and then they douse where it was. Um, and I, frankly, I don't know if they kept the statistics. If they did, I haven't found them yet in the archives. But it was still kind of an interesting, fun little exercise to try and solve this search problem thing. Uh, and they use other attempts at dowsing as well. Um, now, of course, when, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I say, of course, you know, there's a research arm to the Stargate program. There's the military application side, then SRI International, and later SAIC. Um, they had the research part of it, which was a very long and quite uh, well resourced effort. Um, and they did some dowsing experiments out there, trying to trying to figure out how helpful it would be and how useful it was. But to my knowledge, they didn't do any actually dowsing operational work where they actually tried to find relevant things. Now, but, SRI and SAIC are both defense consulting agencies yeah. that are scientifically oriented that are out in California. Mm -hmm. and, and so this big. is on the yes, very big. Very and, big, and they're on the other side of the country from where you were located mm -hmm. in Fort Meade, Maryland. Yes. And so, yeah, they, they did some interesting uh, work out there and, in fact, showed some results. But I don't know if they ever practically applied it. Uh, now, that's you, a question I should ask, uh, actually. Anyway. Yeah. Now, you became involved in dowsing with a local non-military group. Tell me about that. Yeah, so, so the, probably the premier dowsing organization in the United States is the American Society of Dowsers. And they have chapters all over the country. 
uh, including Baltimore, Maryland, or at least they did. I actually tried to tra track them down, see if they're still functioning, but I found no record that they had a, a Maryland chapter anymore. But this was actually at the time newly stood up and it wasn't even in a formal chapter yet. They have a kind of probation period where uh, you have to prove that you can be viable for them, make you an official chapter. I'm working on the search problem. All the old remote viewers had retired or moved on to other assignments. And so we were kind of resurrecting dowsing again. It was mostly on my initiative uh, because we were starting to get a lot of search problem requests. This would have been well, it would have started in 86, 87 when DI Defense Intelligence Agency gained control of the program from the Army. Um, we were getting Mideast hostage situations, uh, many, many, many taskings on those. Um, that was, was a big, big thing. Huh? That was a big deal back in like the 1980s, lots yes, of hostages yes. being taken in the Bekaa Valley and so forth. Yes. Yeah, other places too, but that was the big hotbed of it was the back country in, in Lebanon. Um, and we would describe the settings, and in some cases, it turned out our descriptions were accurate. But here's the problem. Okay, the uh, the hostage that we're trying to locate, we describe as being in a flat-roofed building in a village area that was made up of flat-roofed buildings, all the same color. There was a, a domed building in the middle where people went to gather to worship. Um, there were domestic animals around about, and you know, and then of course they'll say, "Okay, great." <laughs> That's one of like probably twelve hundred villages in the Bacom Valley that look exactly like that. Uh, so we did. Uh, various viewers in the organization did actually describe locations where hostages were that actually could be identified a little bit better, better by associating with known geographical fe features and stuff. Of course, the problem is that they don't they never kept hostages in the same place for any extended time. So uh, our, our intelligence ultimately was not actionable uh, just because of timeliness and frankly, lack of resources. We could have pinpointed these hostages and you, there's no way we would have got a, you know, a SEAL team or somebody in there uh, to get them because of the setting, it would have been kind of a suicide mission. So, um, I mean, occasionally we might have been able to, but we still didn't provide much actionable data from that. So, so here we are struggling with a search problem using the standard descriptive identifying uh, kinds of results that you get from remote viewing. And so I started playing with dowsing again. Uh, found a book by Christopher Bird called The Dividing Hand, which I highly recommend. That's, that's really kind of the gold standard in terms of, of getting an overview of what dowsing is, what's, what the, what's been done with it, and so on. I have um, it, and we'll link to it for the listeners. Excellent, yeah. And Chris, unfortunately, died a while back. I wish I had oh. met him. I was not able to meet him, but he's, he, he did uh, a few other books, but that was probably his most famous one. Um, and so I'm looking around trying to figure out how I can find out more about dowsing. Uh, Self-teaching isn't always the best method uh, in the world. And I uh, looked up the American Society of Dowsers. I think I might even have called them. They said, well, what have you got around here? And they pointed me to the Chesapeake chapter, which met in the Homewood Friends Meeting House. So they met in a Quaker uh, meeting house right across the street from... Uh, from a park and from the Johns Hopkins campus. Uh, and so I dropped in for a meeting one time and they knew I was in the army, but they thought I was just interested in dowsing as a kind of a hobby sort of thing. And, you know, I attended their meetings whenever I could. They met every, might've been month or every other month. I'm trying to remember, but sometimes I couldn't obviously I'd by then a single parent and, you know, there's always stuff going on. Um, they did meet on Saturdays, which was fortuitous because if it had been a week, there was no way. Um, and over time, I actually did learn some stuff, uh, a fair amount. The, it, the folks here were, there were some, some urban folks. There were some old farmers. There was got a real mix of people here uh, who were just interested in dowsing, showed that common uh, interest and have varying levels of experience. The farmers were by far the richest source of information and knowledge uh, about this. Of course, they were more into what, what, uh, what 
you might call field dowsing, which is, you know, you go out and look for water in a field, or, or some people use it for gold and for, you know, you know oil, whatever. Um, but, but generally, that's what they used it for. Um, but it wasn't all they used it for. Even the farmers had used it. They, they, I, I, I teach a couple of, of varieties of, uh, I'm not calling varieties of dowsing, they're just ways of applying it. I call it diagram dowsing, continuum dowsing, uh, and, uh, and map dowsing. And these guys did all of those. And I learned a lot of a lot from them, which I then brought back to Fort Meade and we put into practice. They had no idea. <laughs> so I, I love this. Not only are you a psychic spy externally, but you're also in this classified program infiltrating this group. Yeah, of civilian psychics to to exploit what they know. That's I awesome. An actual agent, didn't I? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you eventually rose to office in this group. Is that correct? That was, that was a, a crowning irony. A crowning irony of this. I was probably into it two or not quite three years, and their president got tired or his time was over, whatever. And uh, I have to back up a minute here, though. So partway through, I'm thinking, I really need to bring somebody else into this from the unit uh, to gain more insight and, and, and whatever. And so um, I invited along Gabrielle Pettengel, or Gabby, as we called her. And she was brilliant. She unfortunately died in a car accident in 2002, which was a huge loss to remote viewing. She was absolutely brilliant. She'd studied physics as an undergrad. Uh, the Army had sent her back for some more of that training. She'd been in a, in a technical intelligence collection organization uh, before she uh, she actually left the Army to come to the remote viewing program uh, as a captain. She was my cubicle mate. We had a cubicle, and she was on one side of the divider, I was on the other. We traded books to read, all kinds of things. And she really mastered remote viewing. She became a great remote viewer, but more importantly, an outstanding remote viewing teacher and trainer. Um, so anyway, I thought, well, Gobby's perfect for this. So I invite her along and we go up there. And so we interacted with them for a while. And one of the fun things was we start, we were, of course, experimenting with dowsing and natural operational work for me. So we developed a few interesting techniques that expanded on what, what I, I and Gobby had learned already. And we were bringing those back to them and teaching them uh, how, you know, some different different approaches and stuff. Uh, didn't do a lot of that, um, but there was a really kind of a cross-pollination going on here. Um, so they're missing a president, and they needed a president, a vice president. At that time, I didn't think I was going anywhere for a while, and I knew Gopi wasn't. So we ended up being elected, a me president, her vice president, and running the chapter. <laughs> 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 which is which is which is great. You've got these secret government psychic spies who have not only infiltrated, I mean, you've penetrated this civilian organization mm -hmm. and then you become its president and vice president. Mm -hmm. And and they have no idea what you're really using this for. But it's the same discipline. And you had this cross pollination going. And uh, so congratulations, you uh, you you infiltrated and took over the civilian organization. <laughs> we have to be careful how we say that because <laughs> there are serious legal issues here. Well, <laughs> and all that. We're just uh, joking. Just to, yeah. be, just, to, just to help people understand we weren't violating the law. We weren't there to spy on persons, on U.S. persons, right? Right. We were there to gain understanding information of a, of a publicly available skill. And, and so we were, we were not bringing back anything illegal, immoral, or, or unethical, right? This was a training thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's talk then about your... Oh, wait, oh go wait, ahead. Wait, yeah. It just occurred to me. So even I got my kids involved, <laughs> right? So um, I brought them to a few meetings, and we at one time had a field exercise where the park across the street... Um, I guess this is my idea. It must have been after I was president. We put silver half dollars, not real silver, obviously, but half, half dollar coins in little uh, baggies. And we go out and hide one somewhere in the park. Uh, we did this a number of times. And my son, James, used dowsing and found it. And we're talking about a pretty good sized park. I was really kind of 
impressed. And of course, we we did it according to typical protocols, so that it was very totally blind. I didn't go to the park with them, and I was the only one that knew where it was. And I made so sure that, that's that good were, blinding. If you're not there, yeah. you can't accidentally give it away by exactly. your blind behavior. And I also made sure that they would not be able to observe where I was in the park. Right. So I I hit it. I came back. Didn't say anything. Sent them off. They used their dowsing procedures, and James found the silver dollar. This is the, the half dollar. It was. Uh, he was so excited. He was about. He would have been about nine, I think, eight or mm-hmm. nine, maybe ten, about that time. And, uh, yeah, it was great. So anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. And I know you've done other things with kids and dowsing, like using chocolate as a reward for finding things. And Oh, yes. That's right. another yeah. story maybe we'll tell later. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about how you used the dowsing skills within the Stargate program. Now, at, at, in the ni- late 1980s, you're getting a lot of requests from uh, the Coast Guard to, you know, intercept contraband that's coming in mm-hmm. uh, to the United States via the Caribbean. And I understand that you use dowsing in that situation with some success. Tell us what happened. Well, I, I, all I can do is tell you some stories because there was a whole bunch of stuff that happened. But I, I'll give you one example. So we got a tip off from a human source. Human is human intelligence. You know, this is the informant, I guess, in the police work of being an informant. We got a tip off from an informant that uh, there was contraband being shipped in to a, cor- a port in the United States. Um, and, you know, that wasn't a, an unusual thing, but uh, there was contraband, contraband coming in all the time. It was drugs, uh, and drugs and stuff like that. Yes. And it was going to be on a container ship. And OK, so let's find out. Well, they discovered that there were six container ships coming into port that day. And um, if you know anything about container ships, you know that they can have hundreds and hundreds. And these days you can have thousands, <laughs> maybe, even t- well, not tens of thousands, but I, but close to it, right, uh, to many thousands of containers on them. They're all stacked up on the deck and down into the hold. And, and uh, so our task was not only to determine where on a given ship the contraband was, but which ship? And so I used dowsing for this in two different ways. First thing was, okay, uh, I, first of all, I had to remote view it and determine we we're talking about contraband, talking about a ship. And I just got the, the tasking number and you know went from there. And once I had done that to their satisfaction, um, then they said, okay, there's actually six ships. We need to figure out which one it's on. Can you do that? I said, okay, well, I'm going to set up as a dowsing problem. And I drew six ovals, each one standing for a ship. And I put letters on each one, A, B, C, D, E, F, F, G, whatever it is. Um, And I said, okay, I'm not going to bother trying to figure out which ship is which. You assign a name to each ship and don't tell me what the name is, right? The name of the actual ship. Uh, and that I'm going to douse this, and presumably the way the subconscious interacts with the universe, I'll be able to uh, identify the correct lettered oval that corresponds to the ship that you're looking for. And so I went went through the process and did that, and I identified uh, peripherally on one, but much more emphatically on another. Okay, so this whole time, okay, they're saying, okay, great, great. So is that ship? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll put that in the hopper, right? And then they said, okay, so take that ship. Where on the ship is it? So here comes the second dowsing thing. Uh, it definitely remote viewing wouldn't work in this case because every one of those containers looks alike. It might be some different coloration stuff on it, but essentially, at best, if you're just going on a physical appearance, you can narrow it down to maybe a hundred containers or more, okay, which is still an insurmountable problem. Um, so I had described the contraband as being clumpy, white, granular, um, I think, and in an enclosed dark space, which is 
a kind of a duh thing because it was in a container, right? And you got um, those descriptions from the remote viewing process. Yes, yeah, from the remote viewing part of it. That's how I described it before I'd done the dowsing. And so that was what I was using my target, uh, clumpy white granular material. Okay. And so um, uh, they thought, oh, it, oh, it, it, it's it's opium or heroin or something. I don't know. They Okay. Cocaine, so, yeah. Yeah. And so... So when they tasked me that, and they said, okay, now you describe this material. Tell us where these drugs are, or narcotics or something. I said, wait a minute, <laughs> on the ship, right? I said, wait a minute, um, I've been, I was tasked to find contraband. And this whole time I've been thinking contraband, don't change the terminology on me in the middle of the session. I'm still looking for contraband. Okay, okay, kind of, he's, stupid eccentric viewer, whatever you want to do here, right? You know? So, um, so I start dowsing and, um, and I, I actually have both of these sessions, uh, both of these process projects. And so I have, maybe I'll, I'll have, I'll provide those to you too. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. So, um, I start dowsing. I, I drew a diagram of the side of the, of a, a notional container ship. You know, without the containers, because who knows how high up they went or anything. Um, you superstructure on the back, long vessel, and this whole thing. And I drew a front view. I don't think I did a side view. Anyway, so I doused both. Uh, and how I did this is I use a ruler to go along. And then, um, so I like the ship, the, the ship diagrams like this. I'll take the ruler and go across like this and then i'm looking for that thrill or that chill kind of feeling what feels right whatever right means just and because this is very kinesthetic it's really hard to assign any kind of verbal description to it right so i move it along and at a certain point i feel very strongly about it and i made an x there and then i did it from the front and i made an x and it was over on the let me get oriented here it was over on the starboard side about, I'd say roughly two thirds up from the stern of the ship, and just a bit above, um, well, on a ship, I guess it'd be gunnels, but you know, just a bit above the edge of where the ship ended and the air began, right? Mm -hmm. So they were able to identify a container that matched that location on the ship. Well, first of all, they identify the ship, that's the location. They stopped the ship and took it over to their wharf where they do these inspections or whatever, I guess, is how they did it. And they broke into the cargo at that point, pulled out that container, or at least opened that container. And it was chock full. Well, I won't say chock full. Of, I don't know how full it was, because I never saw it, right? But it had a large quantity of lumpy, granular, white contraband. Absolute hit. Only it wasn't drugs, it wasn't narcotics. It was rare coral that was being smuggled into the United States. So I was so 100% this was, correct on this. So this was coral that would like grow under the sea, but it was a rare yeah. variety that a collector would yeah, be interested like in. Like an endangered species almost, you know, because mm -hmm. coral is, a, is an animal of you know, the sort. <clears throat> so... Um, we have in the in the archives a report we got in the Stargate archives from the CIA report that was presented that summarized the results. They said uh, the data was produced describing blah blah blah, and the following action was taken, redacted. <laughs> okay, but then the evaluation. Uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but. Uh, Contraband was found as described in the location indicated. And so this is an official document, formally classified, now declassified, that that confirmed this. Now I had heard more detail than was in that report after the fact. We were working for JTF four at the time, Joint Task Force four at the time, which is based out of Key West. Oh, I'm sorry. No, wrong, wrong tasking agency. And I, I can't tell you the actual right tasking agency here, but uh, or the actual location. But uh, but they they gave a description at the time that that action was taken. They reported back to us verbally what had happened, and uh, matched my my work totally. Matched it. 
Then I've, later on, then this summarized report was available once they declassified the archives. I've seen the declassified version of that report, and it's funny what they, you know, government redactors don't always seem to use a lot of common sense, but they, in, in the diagram that you drew with the ovals for the six ships, all you wrote on them was A, B, C, D, E, F, and they redacted the A, B, C, D, E, F. Big black rectangle over the letters. <laughs> now, I don't know, I'll give them a little bit of the doubt. Maybe they had written the ship names in there or something. Uh, over on my diagram. I don't know, but it just seemed a little stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you see you see that in the redaction in the archives. Um, it, I don't know if you read Catch-22, the book. Uh, it's, it's, I've seen the movie. <clears throat> then you won't fully appreciate this. You need to read the book. So the, the main character is a guy named Yossarian. Yossarian has this job. He's convalescing from, I think it was wounds or something. He's in a hospital in, in Italy, if I remember the book right, uh, he's convalescing. They give him a job as censor, and, they, and he's taking this job not very seriously because he decides from day one day to another arbitrarily what he's going to censor. One day he, he censors all the definite and indefinite articles. So, <laughs> so he cut out all the little things, you know, in the letters that people are sending home, and so you're going along and there's all these holes in it where the V's and the, 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 the and you know, A's and the A's yeah. are, are missing, right? And uh, sometimes it looks like the, uh, the redactions in the Stargate archives kind of follow that pattern. It's kind of like random. They take stuff out and you have no idea where they took it out. Of course, if you know what it was, maybe there's a reason, but, but some of the stuff is just lud ludicrous what they've redacted. Cause I, some of these documents, I don't know what's in them. And I look at what they took out and I said, there was absolutely no reason to redact that. And yet they'd leave other stuff in that I said, whoa, that shouldn't be in there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it was bizarre. And so you see that a lot. But now the other thing they did redact also was evaluations in terms of success. The very interesting thing beyond that is that oftentimes the evaluation they redacted, they left. They didn't redact evaluations when they were misses. They redacted evaluations that were hits. So you didn't know why it was a hit, but you start looking at their pattern and realize we really did have success in there because they, they wouldn't have redacted an evaluation that was a hit if it didn't have uh, sensitive security related information in it. So just by going through and looking at their redaction pattern, you can see that we really did have some success that they later on claimed we didn't have. So you had success with dowsing as part of the Stargate program. Let's go back and talk about the history of dowsing. Uh, right. Now, it's been around for a long time. I've seen claims that dowsing is at least 6,000 years old. And as evidence for that, people will point to some cave art from Africa of a couple of figures. It looks like one of them's holding a dowsing rod. And they'll say, okay, so this is ancient African people doing dowsing. But I've looked at those images, and if you examine them carefully, it doesn't, I mean, one problem to my mind is, well, how do you know it's a dowsing rod? Mm -hmm. You know, it, how do you know it, it's not something else that maybe it was a ritual object, they were doing sure. something with it, but it wasn't dowsing? Yeah, there's no context in the, in the image, so. Yeah. yeah, but then you look carefully at the image itself, and to my eyes, and to some other people's eyes, it doesn't look like a dowsing rod at all. It looks like a bow and an arrow, and the hunter is holding the bow and an arrow in such a way that they overlap and look like a forked <laughs> stick. So, that, so they look like a forked stick, but if you look carefully, you can even see the string on the bow and the arrowhead on the arrow. At least that's what it looks like to me. What do you make of that? I know you've seen that art. Yeah, I did. Looking at the image, I think it's very ambiguous to start with. Now, I didn't see this bow string in there. Maybe you and I should have examined it at the same time uh, and we could have talked about it. But uh, the first thing is it doesn't look like a forked stick because you see at the upper tip, they kind of cross. Yeah. So it looks like two sticks. Um. But there's precedent for dowsing using two sticks holding holding mm -hmm. the bottom ends and then crossing and uncrossing, right? Um, 
The other thing is that he's not holding the part that could be a bow the way you would normally hold a bow. At least that's not what it looks like to me. It looks like he does have the end of it, and he does have the end of the arrow stick, which I want to write. Now, on the other hand, the, the, the apparent bow does have a curve like you would in a bow, and there, it's not unprecedented precedent to hold an arrow that way, potentially even hold a bow that way. I mean, it's not impossible. It's possible that the artist uh, just was trying to capture the implements, emphasize them more. Uh, because you know how guns today, people have guns. They're kind of proud of their guns. In fact, you see that in the old 1850 photographs of uh, this family out there. And they, used to, they all have their guns with them. And back then, I can presume, because it's the case in primitive cultures today, that one's weapons are oftentimes one's most prized possessions. So it's possible they're doing that. But on the other hand, well, I, I've kind of said both sides of this. I can't say that we can be conclusive as to what exactly is being depicted there. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a bit of a stretch, but you can think maybe they, maybe they're fire-making tools, because the fire-making tools, you know, you cross them and do that, right? So. I, I think it's just ambiguous. I, I don't know that we can draw a conclusion from okay. what that is, but it would be interesting if it is dowsing, uh, an actual attempt at depicting dowsing instruments that it mm -hmm. came from that long ago. So 6,000 years doesn't seem that far ago for cave art. Yeah, I guess they've dated it. Well, that's the claim I've read. I don't know how they got that number, but obviously some cave art is way older than 6,000 years. And yeah. we'll, we'll show those pictures uh, in the podcast so people can look at them and make up their own minds. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if that's uncertain then about dowsing going back to prehistoric times, what do we know about it during historic times? When do we find records of it? I want to say the most reliable ones start about 500 years ago, although... Uh, there's a mention in Herodotus, Greek, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Greek historian, which is, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on when he was, about 400 BC, I think, mm -hmm. if I remember right, somewhere back then. Uh, it had mentioned there of at least something we could think of as proto-dowsing, you know, early in early form. Um, so it may go back further, you know, we're talking now maybe closing in on 3,000 years ago in the historical record. Mm -hmm. um, but 500 years ago, well, we're in a new century, so maybe it's 550. I don't know, <laughs> some time ago, uh, there there were uh, more descriptive accounts of dowsing in in older literature. Uh, right now, I can't quote you chapter and verse, but there are woodcuts from a from a fairly well known account showing people going over the. Uh, Erzgebirge, I think, in Germany, uh, the, the the mountains where they mine iron and stuff, uh, looking for gold with dows or not gold for for ore deposits with with their uh, fork sticks and such. So um, we do see it coming up then, and of course, it becomes much more uh, prevalent as a topic the closer to the modern era you get. Uh, it really did get quite a boost in the. Uh, 18th and 19th centuries, the 1700s and 1800s, and yeah, a lot of a fair number of references to it, and so on. Um, but it's really in the 20th century where the, where the kind of the doors were blown off of it, right? It's become a big thing, as big of a thing as it is. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of we've mentioned several of them, but just to kind of encapsulate them, what kind of objects or things do people douse for? I mean, for. water. Water is oh. the the most famous one, but you mentioned right. they also douse for gold or other other minerals or metals. What what other kinds of things do people use dowsing to try to find? Well, yeah, usually it's something that will enrich you or solve a problem you have. Uh, like I tell folks, the kind of the uh, stereotype of the dowser is the old prospector in the desert with his burrow and his fork stick trying to find water. You know. Uh, or the farmer in the Ozarks or whatever, you know, uh, need, need to dig a new well. Uh, but at least as old as that use has been is the attempt to find precious metals uh, or substances uh, or oh, valuable, yeah. valuable resources. Oil, of course, more recently, because it's only been since the, the mid-1800s that we've cared about oil, right? So uh, 
but so they just adapt to dowsing from finding gold or water or um, or iron in deposits or whatever. Adapted it to finding oil, and uh, um, it, and it also has been used. And, and I can't trace the history of this back very far. It's clear that at least in those old woodcuts, they were looking for some kind of substance underground. Whether or not they used it to try and find missing people or livestock or whatever. We don't know. Now, there are accounts from the 1800s of them using it to find live, missing livestock and such. Um, I, 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 I've also read account, huh? I've also read accounts of them trying to find missing people with it and trying to find yeah. criminals. Uh, with yes, it. right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and with alleged success. <laughs> you know, again, it's all anecdotal, but still, at least you know they're thinking about it and trying it. Mm -hmm. um, they, they weren't into documenting things in a scientific way back then, but but we can kind of extrapolate back and think that they did have some some of those anecdotal stories. Anecdotal, well, well a story is an anecdotal story, isn't it? Um, some of those anecdotes, uh, I am inclined to think, it probably were were real. Mm -hmm. that they did have have success, and not just imagined success, as we sometimes see being. Uh, touted in, in, in the literature. So, um, One of the things that I know that people sometimes douse for these days, you know, not and not necessarily, I don't know how far back in history it goes, but is, and this is rather abstract, but if you think about, you know, finding water or iron or something like that, it's very concrete. But there are some very abstract applications of dowsing where people are essentially dowsing for the answers to questions. Right. Um, and we get into, I think, is more clearly the realm of divination with that, you know, trying to predict the future, trying to disclose and un or discover the answer to, you know, unknown information that you need for whatever reason. Um, and, uh, and, of course, I, I teach ways of doing that even today when I, when I teach dowsing. Um, and it can be helpful. Obviously, you're looking for an unknown that you have no other way of obtaining. Uh, the answer to. And in, in a case like that, it's like, why not do that? Uh, you're not, you're not going to lose anything. You're not going to un, unknow something you already know by doing dowsing, right? So, so, and it has proven helpful at times. So, I know historically, one of the applications of that has been uh, medical dowsing, where mm -hmm. there would be, someone would be suffering from some condition and it wasn't, People weren't sure exactly what was wrong with them, and dowsers would attempt to achieve a medical diagnosis in answering the question, what's wrong with this person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've heard that, but I haven't had much exposure to it. I tend to try, try and stay away from the medical applications, both remote mm -hmm. viewing and dowsing, because this, those are very problematic. Well, these uh, days we have so much medical knowledge that... Yeah. It, there might, there would presumably be better ways of trying to get that yeah. answer. It, it's much less necessary now. When I say that, it doesn't mean when I when I teach a, I don't know if this tells you or not. Teach a, a an intuition class or, or workshop. I do give an account of one of my students who was able to diagnose some issues with some horses. She's working for a vet. Now I don't remember if she's using dowsing for that now. Okay, well here I start telling you a story about dowsing. I'm not sure it is. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so what types of implements do people use for dowsing? The the classic image is of the forked stick. Yeah. Um, but that's not the only thing that people use. What else no. do they use? No. Uh, I think you demonstrated pendulum in the introduction. Pendulums are kind of classic. Uh, and L rods, so it's, it's a, a piece of wire that's bent in the shape of an L, and you have two of them, or you can do, do it with one. And uh, it, where it is with the fork stick, you walk along and it re, I can come up here so you can see it, reacts by usually dipping down, although the different people have different kind of reaction indicators. Um, and the L rods, you watch what they do. And as you're going along and maybe you're, you're trying to find a um, underground pipe or something because you don't want to, you don't want to have to dig up the whole yard to find it. As you're walking along, as you cross the pipe, oftentimes what happens is the do it like this the wires cross right mm -hmm. and, and tells you that's where it is or sometimes they go like that and show the the directions the pipe goes 
they point out away from each other instead of crossing. Yeah. Um, If you're using one, it may be the direction of swing that tells you what you need to know. Um, And let's see. Okay. So pendulums, Y rods, L rods. uh, Y rods are the fork sticks. Yes. uh, Because they look like the letter Y. Exactly. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> and and then there's also deviceless dowsing, which you well, let's uh, get to sometimes that in use. A second. Yeah, let's get okay. to that thing, because there's a couple other things too. Sometimes just a straight rod can be used for dowsing, and I'll give you an example of that later when we talk on a, on a different topic. Um, they've recently invented these odd dowsing instruments, and they have all kinds of different names for them. But usually they involve a, a grip or handle, and then some kind of screw uh, a spring metal spring and then it ends in a pointer there's like kind of a do- a bobber out there right i think the goal is to force you to dampen your intentional your volitional motions with your hand and then allow that thing to act as an indicator out there on the end picking up your kinesthetic subconscious kinesthetic behaviors um frankly i would never be caught dead walking down the street dowsing with one of those things because dowsing itself is a kind of odd looking thing to an outsider who isn't who isn't tuned into it. That thing just compounds it. It almost looks like you're one of the, a, a rodeo clown <laughs> with some kind of doohickey. You know, you're walking around as you know supposed to be silly. You know, so but people swear by it. <laughs> Interestingly enough, uh, well, we're going to talk about military applications later, so I'll bring that up when when we get to get to that okay now um oh, so deviceless we, you you want me to go there yeah Sorry. yeah so deviceless dowsing so dowsing is a very kinesthetic thing and you talked about the idiomotor idiomotor effect the idiomotor effect ties in with our kinesthetic sensory system and i say sensory because it's so tightly linked to the senses the kinesthetic response kinesthetic effect um Kinesthetics, ha- kinesthetics have to do with motion and feeling yeah. so, and so yeah. forth. So the idea is kinesthetics is it is the underlying sense, a proprio, proprio sensory, I think is the right term, mm-hmm. is part of this. Uh, it's the idea of our bodies. Right. How proprio- our bodies oriented in space, how our bodies react to stimuli. Right. Proprioception uh, and, is the perception of our yes. bodies in space. Yeah, body in space. But we have also proprioceptory. Sen- proprioception. Proprioceptional mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, perceptors actually internally as well, right? In fact, it almost has to be internally because if that's how we, uh, we determine our orientation in space, tied in with our uh, balance mm-hmm. system in our ears and everything else. But we also have a, a, a sensory connected uh, aspect of all of our muscular and muscle movements and muscle energi- energetics and, and all of this kind of stuff, speaking very loosely and confusedly here. Um, and that makes up the kinesthetic system. So in a remote viewing, uh, you have uh, kinesthetic output uh, reactions to encounters with what we call the signal line. That when the remote viewing signal gets in, you can have a kinesthetic, a kind of a visceral reaction to it. And we can track that. And I won't get into the ideograms and all that kind of thing here. But uh, if you are paying attention or if you have something in your hand, you can, you can uh, capture that reaction kind of like a, um, uh, you know, the, the device that you use mm-hmm. <laughs> to measure earthquakes. <laughs> I, 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 I got to, I got to skiss. A kinesiscope stuck in my head. I yeah. can't think of what seismograph. Seismograph. Thank you. Yes, kind of like a seismograph. Dowsing, in a way, the implement that you're carrying, the L rod, the Y rod, the, the, the pendulum, is kind of the readout of the seismograph when it comes to dowsing, right? Um, but you don't actually need that because all of the movement, in my my opinion, people argue with me, but in my opinion. The movement that the implement takes up is actually just an extension of what you're experiencing personally, um, uh, bodily. Um, and it's like, like the needle on a gauge that tells you how much pressure you have in a boiler. Uh, the poor pressure in there is a thing. It has a certain value. The needle's just there to tell you what the value is, and that's what the, the wire rod or whatever does. Um, 
that means if you know how to attune to your body, you should be able to get this get the sufficient indicator from that in a dowsing environment. And I find it works really quite well. I've had more success with deviceless than I have had with device dowsing. There no. you go. Now we've explained it. Now we have. Okay. So um, the, the kind of the classic image of dowsing is you go out in the field and you have your device or not, and you locate something in the field. And so it's a kind of in-person practice. But obviously, from the examples we've talked, we've talked about, like, um, you know, an example of that would be dowsing for teddy bears. You walk through the woman's house, you found the teddy bears. But with the six ships example, you didn't have six ships lined up in front of you. You made a diagram mm -hmm. of six ships and then identified one of them based on that. So obviously, there's more ways of using dowsing than just going out into the field. What are the what are the other ways? The, yes, you've got the field dowsing, mm -hmm. which is the classic way of approaching it. You have I'm going to go in order order of importance or at least order of use. And the next one is map dowsing, where you lay out the map and you douse the map using whatever method you use and try and locate the missing person or whatever on that map. Um there was a famous example of that in the 1970s that President Carter talked about where a psychic found a, a downed plane in Africa using map dowsing. Well, we don't or, know. I don't know that it was map dowsing. I need to mm -hmm. actually, that, that was uh, Dale Graff. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. She located it on a map in any of She located it on a map. Whether she's down, I don't know. I mean, in a way, I you know, the, the brief story I heard was that she just, stuck her finger on the map and there was or made a mark on the map which could be of course a kind of dowsing mm -hmm. um but i didn't have didn't get details on of course she unfortunately that the young woman who did that was uh, rosemary smith and she unfortunately we've determined is passed on mm -hmm. so um but map so, dowsing uh, is is one kind of additional yes, yes. dowsing. Sorry, you got me off on a uh, going down a rabbit hole there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, map dowsing. Okay, so you find something missing, but you use the map as your reference point, and then you use dowsing to find it, which it kind of freaks a bit freaks classical dowsers out because they say, well, well how do you do that? <laughs> you know, you you got this paper thing here instead of out there in the water pulling you pulling your attention, right? Uh, and and I'll say I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I know how you do it. I don't know why it works. Right. Uh, other than I think that 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 crosswalks with remote viewing in some way, or at least the faculty that we use when we remote view. Mm -hmm. um, it's very no obviously very non-local as we use the term. Uh, and then there's um, what I call uh, diagram dowsing, and in diagram dowsing. Uh, I guess probably the easiest way to describe this is let, let's say you have a building uh, and this I'm speaking operationally like we might have used it for me and we get the general layout of the building but but there are different things going on in this building and we're trying to find out what they are and so what you can do is um, and, and we'll even make this very simple we have a floor plan of the building so we know what how it's divided up we don't know what's going on in it so what you can do is you can you can douse Okay, and I'm, I'm I'm confusing you and me at the same time here. That's pretty good feat. Um, let's say you want to find the hostage, and they're in one of these rooms, but I don't know which one, right? And so you can use your pendulum or even deviceless or 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 El Raj or whatever, and then go from room to room to room and essentially ask the question: Is the hostage in this room? Is the hostage in this room? Is the hostage in this room? and dows in that way. And so you have a diagram here, this blueprint or whatever of the building, and you can then use that to help control um, where you're um, getting information from and help you narrow down the, the object, the person, whatever that you're trying to find. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, that's, um, that's another kind. Um, there's, uh, and there's ver various versions of that. Uh, there's a thing I call matrix dowsing, where you just get a piece, piece of paper, an overlay or whatever, and you've got your cross lines, a grid on it. And it's actually, in a way, kind of a refined form of, of, of uh, diagram dowsing, because you can then 
narrow down where you're trying to find something by dowsing the squares on this matrix. Okay. Now that can be pretty laborious if you've got a lot of little squares, uh, but it can help. It can be helpful under certain circumstances. And one of the interesting thing you can do um, is you can turn a map dowsing project into a matrix dowsing by just overlaying a matrix over the map. Now, this comes in handy because what you can do is dispense with the map, give the viewer the matrix, and let the viewer douse the matrix. And then there's a value in that because you can have get mental noise out of the dowsing process just like you have remote viewing. What that means is your left brain tries to guess, yeah. basically, where things for, are. For example, if you have a map in front of you, like let's say it's a map of the United States, you may be distracted by, oh, I like California. I mean, your mind gets attracted to that part of the map. Yeah. Or you're just tr you're thinking, well, it can't be, what I'm looking for can't be in the water, mm -hmm. so you go towards the center of the map. Yeah. And, and by, you, say you end up saying it's in Kansas. And so by using a grid or matrix instead of the map, you can cut out the distractions of the map. Mm -hmm. And then after you've figured out, okay, where would it be on this grid? You can overlay it on the map to find out the real world location. Excellent job, Jimmy. In fact, I might hire you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yes, the, with the matrix and no map, you give the matrix to the dowser. They don't have the map to have those biases uh, interjected. They douse that in a really relatively clean process to eliminate as much as possible the extraneous distractors that might point them to the wrong place. Yeah, so then there's continuum dowsing, which I often use uh, as dows a timeline. So you're trying to find out when an event happened, uh, and you draw a timeline, just a line on the paper, and at one end is the earliest possible time when it could have happened. On the other end is the latest possible time it could have happened. And uh, you can go beyond that, but you don't want to come inside because if you're if you narrow the time band the you know the, the timeline too much, the event might actually have happened outside of the parameters that you establish. So you get the earliest, and you are as generous as possible about this earliest and latest, and then uh, you can slide your finger or a ruler or something along that timeline. And if your if your whole thing is working well, you can identify. Uh, within fairly fairly close proximity when the event happened that you're trying to determine. Okay. Let's talk about dowsing from the faith perspective because, uh, you know, a lot of people are people of faith and, you know, how people relate their faith to practices like this can vary. There are, uh, you know, some people who, who get spooked by anything that has to do with the psychic or the paranormal and want to say, well, it's all demons. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, a, a thing that people will encounter. And that will be our cliffhanger for this episode. Next time, we're going to go straight into the faith perspective on dowsing. And what we have to say will probably come as a big surprise for people. I certainly was quite surprised when I started researching the faith perspective on dowsing. So be ready for that. Until then, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer on the topic of dowsing? We'll have uh, links to Christopher Bird's book, The Divining Hand, the 500-year-old mystery of dowsing. Also, Edsel Cardenas' uh, book, Parapsychology, a handbook, a 21st century handbook, which contains an applied psi chapter co-authored by Paul Smith that talks about dowsing. Also, uh, Cathay Bachler's book, Earth Radiation, uh, which we'll both have a link to where you can purchase it, and it's online at archive.org. And also uh, Alexis Mermay's book, The Principles and Practice of Radiesthesia, which we'll talk more about next week, as well as articles on the idiomotor effect, a link to that video I promised about Michael Faraday's idiomotor experiment, a uh, link to the American Society of Dowsers and Paul Smith's DVD course on dowsing at learndowsing.com. Great. So that's it from us this time. What are your theories about dowsing? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, 
visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work in this episode and all the episodes they do for Mysterious World. You can check out what they do at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. That's my YouTube channel, and I am trying to grow it. We're trying to get up to 40,000 subscribers, so I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe and hit the bell notifications so that you always get notified whenever I have a new Mysterious World video out or one of the other videos I do. So, Jimmy, can you tell us again, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next time, we're going straight into the faith perspective, and it will likely come as a big surprise. So be ready. Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at, like you said, Jimmy's YouTube channel, where you should definitely hit the bell to get notifications. You'll find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 246. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Thank you.